you know, Jeff, you know, Brent, if we don't get this started soon, this is going to be the very long night of Brent and Jeff recording a podcast. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you what, no matter how long this goes, if we're done in five minutes or 16 hours, because there is a version of this podcast that'll go 16 hours long. I'm not going to say, I'm sorry. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> oh yeah. It really, what Jeff, here's a question for you. What is the longest recording you have ever done for a podcast? Oh, that's a great question. I can think of an interview that I did. Oh my gosh. I did one for the star uh, fleet leadership Academy. I did one with, uh, um, Eliza van court. You can go and listen to it. We recorded for almost four and a half hours. Yeah. And, uh, I have, I think about a 40 minute episode out of that. <gasps> it's not that stuff was bad. It's that we went so deep into things yeah. and other stuff and we were enjoying the converse. It was just us enjoying it. And when I went through and kind of edited it, I'm just like, yeah, this is not, not what my audience is looking for. Yeah. It's great. It's awesome. I love what I did in that, but you need, you need to find an outlet for that particular content that you, that you made. And push mm -hmm. that oh, absolutely. Out. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, I think that's about me. We're um, so between four and five hours. Uh, it was not that though. It was just legitimately. That was how much we had to discuss. Really? Mm -hmm. And we didn't, we never set a time limit on ourselves. Like it was, well, to be fair, our uh, season two wrap up took us about four hours to record, but we took a break in the middle. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. that was, a that one was a beast that to, one was to stitch together. Yeah. Yeah. And to listen to for people. Yeah. I, I know. Well, with that, Jeff, uh, I was just curious. I just wanted to know, uh, why don't we jump into this episode? Uh, what you guys out there, you're about to watch Jeff and I recording our podcast episode on the very long night of Londo Malari. This is season five, episode two. Jeff and I are going to be recording that you guys are watching the behind the scenes. This is how we make the show in fact this is the show about the show as we like to say this is the better show but that also means that you guys get the unedited version a lot of times people save this for their patreon no no no. we don't put this one behind a paywall this is the show uh you guys get this out here you get to see all the flubs all the mistakes the long pauses where we're thinking of responses all that sort of stuff uh and you get all the stuff that gets cut out, all the real funny stuff and things like that. So I don't know how much funny is going to be in this episode, but Jeff, if you're ready, buddy, let's hit that button and let's get into this episode. Can't wait to do this one. At least I should have popped it just once. Humans form communities. And from that diversity comes a strength. Now get the hell out of our galaxy. The year is 2024. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for, for the first, first time. time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am the one who was. And I'm Brent Allen, and I am the one who will be. And we're watching Babylon 5 for the first time for you, the one who is. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters searching for those important messages that Babylon 5 is delivering in its own unique way. That's right. We're looking for those Babylon 5 messages, not those Star Trek messages. And since this is not a Star Trek podcast, we've decided that we will have the rule of three. This limits us to no more than three references to Star Trek per episode in total, not a piece, but total of three references or less. That's it. Three. One of those three. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. And if we do make one of those references, you're going to hear this. That's right. Because while this is most definitely not a Star Trek podcast, those references may slip in from time to time. Now, along with our game, The Rule of Three, another game we like to play at the end of the show is where we try to guess what next week's episode is going to be about based on title alone. Well, this is the spot where it's time to play time to pay the piper and this is where we revisit our prediction from last week to see if we got it right in time to pay the piper jeff so i will ask you my friend what did you say the very long night of londo malari was going to be about and how close were you 
thought Londo was headed to Centauri Prime, was going to be named Emperor, and was going to be tormented by memories and uh, the trauma of the shadows and Cartagia and the, his time that he uh, he spent last time he was on the home world. I'm going to give you half a point on this one, 50%, because he certainly was tormented by memories of everything. There you go. I'm going to give that piece to you. Cool. What about you? What did you think? Well, I said that this was Londo going to be emperor. I think I later amended it, uh, maybe even for the Burnt Watches video. Like, this is maybe the eve of his coronation or something like that. It's basically his first night on the job. And all he wants to do is get some sleep. But he kept, but he keep, but he keeps getting interrupted with affairs of state, you know, and, and it just almost like a comedy. Uh, it just ensues over the course of the uh, of course of the episode. Everything's just going wrong, and he keeps getting woken up in the middle of the night. That's exactly what I said it was going to be, and... Well, it had Londo in it, and um, <laughs> and he, and he kind of kept getting interrupted while he was sort of, sort of, kind of... Sl- I'm going to... It had Londo. I'm going to give you 0.15 credit on that one for mentioning Londo. That's about 0.14 more than I think it deserves. Well, I mean, it only has Londo's name in the title. I mean, I mean, mean, as you said last time, so did whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi. And we got him for about 39 seconds in that one. Yes. Yes. Jeff, I think if you and I were both college professors, students would love to take your course because you apparently grade on a really generous curve (laughs) and they would hate mine because there's no such thing as a curve in my course. I just figure you're failing. I might as well boost your ego a little bit. It's still a failing uh, score. You know what? I appreciate that. <laughs> well, for those of you that it might've been a while since you've watched this episode, for those of you that have never watched it at all. And you're wondering what we're talking about and what is Londo Malari doing in an episode called the very long night of Londo Malari. Hey, Brent, why don't you tell us about this one? Well, so. Now that Lanier has been permanently friend zoned by Delenn after her marriage to Sheridan, and since Lanier will never love another, he will take no wife. He will hold no lands, father no children. He shall wear no crowns and win no glory. Night gathers, and now his watch begins with the Rangers. Also, Londo and Veer discuss an ancient Centauri fairy tale, one in which an angelic soul that happens to be inhabiting the body of a monster of a person has the ability to kill the body just so that it can escape, which is just an old Centauri wives tale, right? Right? Okay, let's get to the meat of the episode. Londo's having it out with Zach over some Centauri booze that has been impounded in customs. And Londo apparently really needs a drink. While we consider if he might have a slight problem, Veer tries to reason with Zach, but it's no good. Londo has snuck a little sip and he passes out. Poisoned with the Bravari in the cargo bay. Actually, turns out it wasn't poison at all. It was an angelic being forcing Londo to have a heart attack. And the rest of the people. And as the rest of our cast is milling about doing their thing, Londo is visited by the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. And first up, the ghost of Christmas past. And tonight's performance of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. In tonight's performance of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, the part of Ghost of Christmas Past will be played by Delenn. Delenn has a black shroud over her face and a deck of tarot cards, all symbolizing the life choices that Londo has made. Except the deck is bleeding, symbolic of how much blood has been spilled that Londo is personally responsible for. She tells Londo he is dying. Londo remarks that Maybe it's just better that way. But then Ghost Delenn asks Londo a very familiar sounding question. What do you want? Oh, no, no, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It was, do you want to live? Londo says, yes. She says, well, then say the word. 
a single word will set you free. Suddenly, there's a pulsating heart just below an iron grate in the floor. Wait a minute. Jeff, I thought this was Christmas Carol, not Telltale Heart. All right, well, flash over to another scene, and judging by all those empty bottles, actually, maybe this is Cask of Amontillado, come to think of it. Nope, nope, nope. We're definitely back to Christmas Carol because here comes the ghost of Christmas future who looks like a who looks a lot like a quick changing Sheridan. They discuss what it's like to be dead, you know, since Sheridan once was dead for a few minutes anyway. And then they move on to discussing the shared reality. And then they move on to discussing the shared reality that they both know that they're living on borrowed time. Londo regrets that he hasn't used his days very well. And Sheridan tells him there is something he could do. He could turn around. Londo knows what that means. And he seems to know that the ghost of Christmas present is standing directly behind him. A red and blue eyed Jakar just waiting for Londo to turn around and face him. Londo says he can't. He can't. And Sheridan just sort of orbs out of there. Well, Londo finally drawing up the courage to turn around and face Ghost of Christmas Present. There's Jakar. Waiting to take him the rest of the way through his journey. Jakar talks about Londo. Even if Londo didn't personally order the attacks or maybe do the attacks, he still simply stood by and let it happen. Everything from the invasion of Narn to the use of the mass drivers, all the way to the torture of Jakar by Cartagia. By Cartagia. Jakar says that a single word from Londo in any of these situations, even if no one would have listened to him, a single word could have been enough to save him. But Londo just remained silent and he is just as guilty as the rest of them. Londo reiterates his desire to live, and he even endures the 39 lashes that Jakar did. There is just one word that Londo has to say, and this is all going to be over. But it's a word that Londo has never, ever used in his life. He has never apologized to someone. Londo's pride begins to kick into overdrive, but it apparently quickly wears out. And before long, we see this dream world Londo pounding on the floor where the heart is, screaming that he's sorry, that he is so very sorry. And then this even plays itself out in the real world where he opens his eyes from a coma, locks eyes with a nearby Jakar and says, I'm sorry, Jakar. And with that, Londo's heart stabilizes. The angelic being doesn't kill him, and he's on his way to a full recovery. So I guess that whole thing really was just a wives tell, oh, uh, except Veer goes back to it and clues this in. You see, the body has the ability to choose forgiveness or not when it's under attack from the angelic being, the angelic soul. So in the myth, the person is either forever changed or they die. Well, Londo's alive, so it looks like he might be forever changed. Jeff, what did you think of this very... message filled episode the one that could be retitled the redemption don't don't, don't, don't you say it ah brent i loved this episode i loved this episode i needed this episode so badly yeah but the thing is 
I needed it between no surrender, no retweet retreat. Please. I needed it. Again. Please. <laughs> no retweet. tweet. <laughs> Mowage. <laughs> I needed it between no surrender, no retreat and between the darkness and the light. I like they became buddies. Uh, they became almost comic relief before this happened and it kind of undercut the big moment, but the big moment was still huge and I get it season four or five. It was a cluster. It was weird. They had to make choices. They made choices. I'm not going to hold that against this episode. Um, do you, I just say this, do you like that? They came, even though it's kind of chronologically out of order, are you glad that they still came back to this? God? Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because I think if we go all the way back to passing through Gethsemane, which set the tone for season three, and we talk about forgiveness, and then we're faced with these two monstrous relationships between Londo and Jakar, and then Sheridan and Garibaldi, right? Where with Sheridan and Garibaldi, I mean, I don't know, maybe we'll get more there, but it just kind of seems like they had some bro moment behind closed doors and we're cool now. But that's what happened between Londo and Jakar is much bigger, much bigger. And this had to happen. I, I agree. If I just to bounce off that real quick, I did find this one very interesting watching, especially particularly the entire conversation happening with Jakar and Londo uh, in the dream world. And all I could think was I saw glitter and confetti on the heads of both Londo and Jakar sitting in an office, sharing a drink after a wedding. And then we get this episode, like it definitely felt backwards. You said to me before we came on mic tonight that you really felt like this could have been a season four, should have been a season four episode. And I, I agree. It really could have been back there. And I also like you 100% understand why it wasn't. And I'm very glad they came back to it. Yeah. This, this know. had to, we had to see this. Yeah. One of my favorite things about this one, and you, you talked about it in the recap is it anticipated my confusion and almost growing resentment of the episode as it was going on. Cause like, I don't know, 20 some odd minutes into the whole thing. I'm like, why are there rules? How come Delenn can only ask him one more time? Like, I don't get it. And the more the episode went on, the more I had this little thing in the back of my head of just like, this doesn't make any sense. But then Veer comes in with his little wives tale. They explain it all away. And I'm like, that's, that's a little corny, but you know what? It works. I'm, I am going to ride that train. That works for me. I think hand waving can be fine sometimes. This was, I mean, this is awesome. We're going to talk a lot about what happened. I will say like there was some linear stuff in this that, um, I hate it. I hated everything about it. This is a, in my mind, a complete 180 from who he is as a character. It made no sense to me at all. The only way Lanier's story can end now and I'll be cool with it is if Sheridan and Delenn decide to lean in, lean into the uh, Minbari interpretation of the number three. But we'll see. We got a whole season in front of us. What were your, uh, what did you first think of this one? Jeff, you, my friend, as much as I love you and as much as we're in this show together, there are certain things that you are not allowed to say that only I am allowed to say. Those are your words. That I'm the only one who's allowed to say it. You're, I'm sorry. Like, they belong to me. They don't belong to you. You're not allowed. This episode is the redemption of Londo Malari. <laughs> we finally got there. I could just, I could see right now all of the memes and all of the tweets over in Red Sector, I know we've already seen a few that have come out just since the Brent Watches video and the the even the Jeff reaction video has dropped and, and you and me recording right now. But it's I, I could just oh my gosh, we we've taken so much flack. I have taken so much flack about asking about if this is the redemption of Londo Malari. Uh, but we've we've come back to it. And you know, I declared a long time ago. He is beyond redemption. He is irredeemable at this point. And I know people are asking me, do I still think he's irredeemable after all of this? Well, we'll get there. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. 
for what that means and what is redemption and how does redemption work and is is everyone still qualified is anyone ever truly irredeemable we're going to talk about that because that's a big part of what this episode really is all about uh jeff this was a truly phenomenal episode um this is the kind of an episode that makes me so glad we decided to watch this series yeah this is an episode that needed Eighty some odd episodes before this one to pay off. Maybe it could have dealt with like seventy-seven, you know. But it needed the entire journey. It needed the entire arc to pay off. Do you remember back in season? I want to say it was season three. I think it was the dust episode. Dust to dust, yeah. Season yeah. three, and in that episode, Jakar winds up tripping out on some some drugs. And he winds up having this come to Jaquan moment at the end. Do you remember that? Yep. And Koss oh, yeah. comes in and does this whole thing. It, it was in that episode that Jakar got sent on a new path. It was, it was a marquee setting moment for him. It changed his character for who he is uh, for the better. It, maybe it, it, maybe it, it like a Pokemon, it just evolved him to the next level of what he supposedly was. I think we've seen something similar with Sheridan. Sheridan has had one of these big major moments. Delin has definitely had one of these big major moments. Ivanova might have actually been the first to have one of these major character defining moments. Has Garibaldi ever really had one of these? I don't know. Hmm. Veer, Veer has had these moments. Veer seems like he's had about five of these moments, <laughs> you know. But here is Londo's. This is a character, this is a, a turning point for Londo for the good I have been waiting for this episode for three seasons now has it been three is it four however long it's been yeah whatever three and a half seasons I've been since waiting. the coming of shadows really yeah yeah um and I quite loved this episode the linear stuff I would have been perfectly happy if that was shoved off to a different episode altogether and we replaced the nine minutes that that episode that that portion of the episode took with more of what we got that would have been perfectly okay with me i don't know what's going on with lanier and his whole thing we'll find out we'll get there because his because listen he's still in the opening credits now don't remind me of keffer who was in the opening credits the whole season we saw him like three times Linear is not going anywhere. He's such a huge part of this cast. He's going to be around. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I love this episode, Jeff. I absolutely yeah. love this episode. Um, I think this is going to be an interesting conversation, though. Agreed. Um, so. <sighs> well, I think I think before we even talk about that, I think what we need to just acknowledge. So for people listening to the audio podcast on YouTube, we talk a little bit before we start the podcast. And we kind of joked on there that there's a 16 hour version of this podcast within us that we is waiting to get out. We're not going to talk about everything. There's no way we don't on a regular basis. You know, I mean, for last week's episode, we didn't talk about Sheridan socks and that whole ridiculous thing. Not important, right? Although I will just say that should have been his answer to Lorien when he's like, what do you have to live for? And he was like, Dylan, he should have been like my socks. <laughs> They're waiting for me, but he didn't, but we're not going to dive I into still, this. I just, I'm sorry. I refuse to believe that Sheridan and Dylan have been married for however many weeks they've been married now. And Dylan has watched him creepy like a bunch of times before now and woohoo and all that sort of stuff. And this is the first time she's ever seen him do socks. Maybe he has 300 pairs of socks and she's just now seeing him wash them. Maybe they do things different in the future, I guess, but, I guess. but I just want to acknowledge, we're not going to dive into everything. There's no way there's no possible way that we can. So there's going to be stuff. You can leave it in the comments. You can hit us on Twitter, Mastodon, whatever, be like, Oh, what about this thing? Yeah. What about this thing? So much. We're going to dive into the stuff top of mind for us. We've watched, I've watched this one twice. I did my reaction. I watched it again to do my notes. That's it. This is one I'm going to watch 
a lot more times at some point because there's so much to unpack in it. You know, Jeff, I, I often talk about how episodes are what I call laundry episodes. Mm -hmm. You're flipping through the channels, you're folding laundry, the episode's on it. Oh, yeah, I'm going to watch this episode. You can kind of go in and out. This is not a laundry episode. This is an episode you're doing laundry, you're flipping the channels, this episode comes on, you put the laundry down, and you pay attention. Yeah. That's that's what you do. And you don't change the channel when it goes to commercial because you're not missing in a second of this episode. Uh, I would I would say this, Jeff. If anyone wants more thoughts from Brent and Jeff, you can go over to our Patreon page and you can check out our notes. Mm -hmm. Jeff and I have more notes than I'm sure what we will actually talk about in today's episode. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Jeff, I, I think this. Let's just talk about Lanier. Let's get that mm -hmm. piece out of the way. And then... My guess is the rest of the conversation is just going to be the message because that's what the whole, the whole thing was a message. So I, I'm guessing that's probably what's going to do. Let's, let's just talk about linear. Let's get that piece out. Of the okay. Way. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, you said you hated it. Can I just tell you that he's a liar, liar, pants on fire, but Mimbari don't lie. But they, mm, he's not even saving anybody's honor. Let me, let me, let me just see if I can jog the memory a little Wait, bit for so. you. I'm yeah, going go to uh, channel my inner Veer. I'll have you channel your inner Delenn. Okay. And I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, my place is by your side. Always. Come fire or storm. Come fire or storm or darkness or death. I am to be by your side for all time. Huh. Huh. Weird. Weird how everything changed. When there goes my old girlfriend, she's got a, another diamond ring. I don't know. I messed those lyrics up, but. No, actually, that was perfect. That was it. And all those late night late promises, night promises. I guess they don't mean a thing. Yeah, I, mm, I, him becoming a ranger, that's on brand for me. I'm fine with that. It's the way and the why that he did it. Yeah, absolutely. Here's here's my note for that. Uh, my problem with this is, and and Sheridan called it out for exactly what it was. Lanier is running away from the situation. He is not running to the rangers. If Lanier was doing his thing, doing his thing, something happened with Marcus. And there was a new calling on his heart. Something shifted, something changed in him. And he's got to go become a ranger. Fine. That is not what is happening here. No. He can't handle that she is sleeping with that dude every night. And and I mean physically sleeping with the dude, not although that other stuff too. But and on a slanted bed at that. He's on. He's he, he, Sheridan's doing the thing. He's Dude, all in. Listen, listen. If I'm Sheridan, I'm like, look, baby, I love you, but we are either getting a sleep number with an adjustable bed on each side, or you're learning to sleep flat because uh, this ain't gonna work for me. Um, my feet hurt at the end of the night. I'm going from a woohoo to a woo ow. Ooh. Right, right. And that bed still looks hard as heck and really uncomfortable. Anyway, um. Lanier is making this choice because he can't handle it. And you know what, Jeff? That's fair. He, he should be able to handle it, but it's also fair for him to want to leave. Yeah. He has it bad for this girl. I remember those days and he's like, look, she's with, I, I, I can't stay here anymore. It is driving me crazy. It is it is, it is making me heart sick. At the same time, I think it's a bad move for Lanier. I think there is there like that. That's fair. That's that, that can happen. We also can grow up and we can be adults about this. <laughs> you know, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go 20 years down the line, having unrequited love and be sitting there looking at him. You always loved her always. Like that should never actually be a real thing that comes out of a 30, 40 something year old adult's mouth. Like, no, I'm over that. I got over that a long time ago. I've moved on. It mm -hmm. just ain't happening. That person's with that person over there now. Good for them. 
I'm moving on with my life. You should be able to do that. Not everybody does though. And it's okay. Lanier's problem again. He is running away, not running to. He thinks the Rangers are the only place he can go. But here's the deal. He's going to go over here to the Rangers. He's not going to find fulfillment over there either. No. Marcus never did. He's kind of, he's more following Marcus's footsteps, not honoring Marcus's legacy. Oh yeah. I like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's, and it's this really weird, like, yes, he should be able to get over it, but it's okay that he doesn't. And it's fair for him to go do this, but he should be able to get over it is kind of what I'm saying. I'll tell you the person I had the biggest problem with though was Delenn. Okay. Because there's a moment where he's looking at her and, and Lanier in, in probably the most mature thing he said in the entire time was I'm not comfortable here anymore. Delenn. I'm not okay. And Lynn, Delenn looks at him and goes, but you said you'd be here forever for him to clearly and explicitly state I'm leaving and I'm not comfortable here. And she knew why he was not comfortable. It was, she it was, knew last season she brought it exactly. up. Exactly. And she knew why for her to then turn around and still try to manipulate him mm. into staying. That's not okay. Not okay. Thankfully she didn't continue to press it. It's just, oh, he's got to follow the calling of his heart. And if it doesn't work, the universe is going to grab him and teach him. Okay. That's she's letting him go. But also aren't, according to Minbari faith, aren't we the universe and isn't she as a mentor responsible for that in some way to your point, right? Like no. I'm not, I'm not comfortable being here anymore. Let's talk about that. Yeah. No, let me hear you. Yeah. No. And I'm going to, I'm going to answer why, because she is the object of the uncomfortability. The, those conversations can't be had with her. They need to be had with a different mentor. Because, because of her being the object of all of that. Because she's so sense? involved. It does make sense. That, yeah. That's the only, now, if it had been anyone else, absolutely. Absolutely. But just because it, it being her, it, it could not be Delenn talking him through that. And it almost like that point even just punctuates what you were saying, where it's almost worse, where she's like, you said you would always be here. Mm -hmm. Hey, I know you, I know you got it for me bad. I know you're not comfortable. You just told me, but like, now I'm just going to, I'm going to dangle it out there again for you. Yeah. Like, but you said you'd be here. You'd yeah. be, yeah, no, I, I didn't really thought about it in, in that regard, but you're right. I mean, I think, I think a thing that's just coming to mind for me now, so it's not a fully baked thought, but Delenn can be a very eloquent talker. Mm -hmm. I think she's a terrible listener. Mm. And I, and I, and I think that that's, I think that speaks to so much of what we see all the way back in season one, where they're telling her about the chrysalis thing and the prophecy. Hey, that sounds good. We want to hear, we want to look at that, but not now, not you, not, Oh, I'm going to go do it anyway. And then moving into season two and it just, there's this real long line of her just refusing to listen and yeah. restating her own. Re we saw that in last week's episode where Hey, don't go to the inauguration, but you have to go to the inauguration. That's the way it's always been. Yeah. Are you listening well, to this man? I, I Because I think what Delenn has install, installed probably in Lanier is this idea of following the calling of your heart. There's nothing wrong with following the calling of your heart. The problem is, is when people use that as an excuse to justify what they want to do. Lanier's, Lanier's calling of his heart is not to the Rangers. No. You know, but he's going to, but he knows he can throw that line out and it'll justify what he wants to do. Same thing with the whole chrysalis thing. It's the calling of her heart. Oh, they want Delenn to go back and be the new leader of the great council, but no, I've got to go over here and do this thing because that's the calling of my heart. You're, you're using that to justify you. Like that's a thing that takes a lot of soul searching to really discover and find out. And maybe Delenn's real calling of her heart was to be at Babylon five. But the way she handled that in that moment, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. I find it interesting, though, that he's running away from Sheridan and Delenn to join the Rangers. It's how he's running away. 
But hey, who's in charge of the Rangers? <laughs> good point. That's like how, point. how far away are you really running, my friend? Like, oh, that's what he on. said. I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna visit. I'm gonna I'm gonna do all this kind of stuff. I just can't be here where you guys are waking up with each other and being the first person who comes in and opens your curtains for you in the morning anymore. You know, now here's the thing. And, and you mentioned earlier that this is a betrayal of Lanier. When Lanier first kind of said that he had a thing for Delenn, that he loved her for Delenn, he, I, I don't remember who he was talking to. Maybe it was Marcus, maybe Marcus. it was somebody else. But he said, you think of it as romantic love, but for Mimbari, it is much deeper than that. The way that this came off by this episode, it felt like this was a middle school crush. 100%. Not something much deeper. And I really liked the idea that there is another level of love to the Mimbari that actually isn't a romantic or a sexual love but is is some sort of a soul connection that doesn't require the the romantic side of it you know what i mean yeah and that that, that could that relationship could be intact for lanier and delenn and be 100 pure and 100 positive and in no way shape or form be in conflict with what she and sheridan have it could be Maybe that they did. That's not the, that's not the way that we chose to explore that, that concept in the show. What we got was no Lanier's got a crush and he just hasn't figured out how to get over it. Mm -hmm. That's what we got. Yeah. It was very disappointing. And I, cause I think, I think the on brand version of Lanier could still leave. He could still leave, Yeah, but there would be a different motivation by like, what we've just talked about. Right. But it, it is literally to, I, I'm just restating what you said, but this is deeper than romantic love. It's actually so much deeper. It's just middle school lust. Like it goes so deep from romantic love. It just circles all the way around and becomes less than mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. I, I hated, I hated the linear stuff. So one more question and let's move on from this. Sheridan says, you know, yeah, where I come from three is a crowd and, and Delin says, but on men bar three is a sacred number or a perfect number or whatever. What could that actually look like without, without turning this into a, a polygamous relationship? Cause I don't think that's where this is going or that's what was intended. Uh, what, unless it is, I mean, well, you hey, know, I, it's but, on our ignorance here. Neither one of us are in polyamorous relationships. I've never, I never have been, I have no desire to be it. God knows it's enough work to be monoamorous sometimes. Right. Right. But I, I think there's so many things that that can be. And I think, I think it goes to that concept of a love deeper than romantic or physical or sexual love. Mm -hmm. There's so much more that can be done there. I, I, to, to point to, you know, America's favorite film franchise, uh, fast, and and furious. fast and furious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's family. It's family. Right. Your family can take a lot of forms. You know, my, uh, my wife has talked a lot about how, uh, so in her culture, she's Lebanese and in her culture, there are people they are polyamorous and have multiple wives and it's a thing that happens. And it's, it's not what you think where it's just like a dude surrounded. Well, some of them are just a dude surrounded by his harem, but the functional ones are one where every person plays a very specific role and it's not always romantic. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a version of the three of them coming together and really being a, a singular unit that could really work and have that deeper love that, that, that love, you know, I mean, we've talked about it here before. There's the like filioque and agape and the, they're like the three, four, you know, Greek types of love, brotherly love and uh, parental love and romantic love and all those different things. Minbari love. It's a whole different type and level that mm -hmm. we haven't cracked yet. All right. So Lanier, he's going away. He's gone till he comes back. Right. Londo has a heart attack. He goes in and has an inner soul experience. Jeff, but before we get into talking about all the stuff, I've got to give you one, one, well, I, uh, one light concept from this whole thing. Uh, I love my prop replicas. 
Oh yeah. There were two prop le- replicas in this episode that I, I need, I need to know that somebody makes them and I need like, take my money. I will buy them. I want a bottle of Bravari. Okay. I don't care what the liquid is inside. I want the bottle. I want the label. Give me some maroon colored liquid. I'm, I'm good, but I, I want guarantee you that exists. Some, there's a label. There's a sticker. There's a bottle somewhere yeah. that exists. I would hope so. I would hope so. Two, I need a pack of Londo tarot cards. Same right here. Shows his past with tarot like cards. I need those cards. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want those cards. Okay. So let's, let's talk about Londo's very long night. Oh, well, even before we get there, one, I, I, I enjoy, I have a lot of fun. I've been having a lot of fun this last uh, season and into here pointing out things I like about Dr. Franklin. Okay. He was great in this episode. He got pushy with the medical staff when Londo was coding at one point. But what I loved about it is he wasn't pushy. He was pushing, right? Like old Franklin was pushy and a jerk. This Franklin was running a tight ship and making sure everybody was on board doing what they needed to do to take care of Londo. I really liked Franklin in this episode. You said your redemption along to Malari. I said, I like Dr. Franklin. Everybody mark your calendars. So it's just March. This will be out on the 11th, I think. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> but yeah, I think from here, like we're blow people's minds here a little bit. I think it's time, Brent, that we talk about all of those important messages, right? We boil this all down. Isn't that wild? <laughs> there was a day in this podcast where this was about the normal part of the episode where we got to this mo- moment. I know. <laughs> These episodes carry a lot more in them than they used to. Yes, I, they- I can remember as an aside in the first season, somebody was like, wow, an hour, hour long conversation about, I don't know, death Walker or whatever. Yeah. Can't wait till they get to episodes that are full of, you know, actually have stuff. I wonder how long this will be. Here you go. Well, let's find out. <laughs> Because I do think we're at the point of the show. We're going to not necessarily boil this all down. We're going to talk through it all, but we're going to talk about the deep. We're going to talk about the deep morals, the messages, all of the things that are in this episode. As we conclude our discussion on all of the messages in this episode, Brent, you're going to rate this on a scale of zero to five white stars as to how strong the message is and just how Babylon five it was delivered. Um, Want to dive in? Well, so with, with that, Jeff, um, typically when we get to the spot, uh, who, whoever does the recap is the person who does the white stars for the episode. So this is where I would pontificate for a few moments over the messages and stuff that I pulled out. Obviously, we haven't actually really talked about this part of the episode because something you and I acknowledged before we ever came on mic tonight was there's no way to discuss this part of the episode without discussing the messages. It's, it's just going to be part and parcel. They're going to go together. Um, so different from the way that we normally do this, Jeff, I, I fully invite you in to help me with this and to just have this be part of the conversation because there's stuff that you got, got that I did not get probably vice versa. I hope, um, there is, there's no way that I captured everything and, and I'm not going to be able to boil this down to just a couple succinct things. It's more just, we've got to take it piece by piece and, and try to try to unwrap it. I will, however, though, reserve the right to be the sole distributor of white stars at the end. Oh, hundred percent. I'll take, I'll take your feedback. Um, spoiler alert. You should already understand what that is going to be. But yeah, I'll just tell you there, there is one correct answer to the number of white stars. Yes. And that number is greater than four point nine, 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 nine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No question. So Londo goes into his little dream state and he meets a, a, a Delin, a version of Delin, let's say, who is, is kind of taking him through the hard parts of his life and Jeff, the most interesting piece out of this whole deal to me was the question she wound up asking. And this is what jumped out to me. I don't know if it jumped out to you. The whole thing went wrong with Londo when somebody came aboard the station and asked him a very simple question. 
what do you want? Think about where Londo was at this point. We had seen him in bed with uh, Adira, mm-hmm. and he had told her people, people like the whole, whole idea of Republican and being about your name and your glory and your house, like that's all garbage. That's not what's meaningful in life. He was there. We heard Londo say, I forgot how to dance. Remember that Londo? So like this great. Londo who, is, who was just like, he's hit maturity. Like he, he's got it. He's on the other side. And somebody comes in and goes, what do you want? Perhaps his answer should have been, I want to live. Perhaps I want to I dance. Should. I want to dance. Yeah. I want to live. Whatever, whatever that is, I don't want to die. That's what I want. Instead, Londo retreats back onto the old familiar of, I want to see us great. All that stuff that he said he was over and really didn't mean anything, he said that's what he wanted. And where did that lead him? It led him down, down paths that he never wanted to go down. It led him, da- it led him further than he ever wanted to go. And it kept him there longer than he ever wanted to stay. And now we're given the question. Do you want to live? Maybe let me amend this question for Delin just a little bit. Don't you want to live? Hmm. Don't don't. Isn't this really what you want? Not this death, not this blood that, that is so blue. But what is it you really want? Because if you don't want to live, we'll just, we'll take you out right now, right? But I found that to be so interesting of comparing the, juxtaposing the two questions of what do you want versus do you want to live? What do you think of this section, Jeff? It really reminded me of Sheridan and Lorian. And, you know, Lorian really was, he talked about, you know, what do you have to live for? But he, he asked the question, we had that third question, right? So we had the, what do you want from the shadows? And then we have the, um, you know, who are you from the Vorlons? And then we had, why are you here Mm -hmm. from Lorian that kind of brought it together? And that's what I got. Like, do you want to live? Yeah, that's not enough. Yeah, it's not enough. You need more. And so what is that more? And yeah, so that's what what it just really hit me as to there. There's living Mm -hmm. and then there's surviving. Mm -hmm. And I think that ever since Morden and Londo had that first run in Londo has been dumped into survival mode. He hasn't been alive. Right. Since early in the first season or middle of the first season, Mm -hmm. truly alive. And this was his first moment where like it, it showed, I, th- I found it so powerful when Delenn was showing him those cards and she says, uh, you know, look at this, look at this. And he says, I can't, there's too much blood. There's too much blood yeah. there. She's like, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, so in your survival, you caused the death of billions, mm-hmm. political strife, unrest, the entire galaxy mm-hmm. was pulled apart. So now are you done surviving and killing everyone around you? And you're ready to live again. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I think back over the last two and a half seasons and even the Londo in the chamber where he's got to be the one who delivers these hard line messages. Remember when Londo's hair went black and his fangs got really sharp? And he wore all the, his clothes got all military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even then, there were times when you would see Londo pause and take a breath and then push forward, you know, and it was in that breath that you're like, Londo, there is hope for you. You kept pushing it down. And you kept saying no. But the question is, do you want to live? What, what, what do you really want? Is this, this, this this is this what you want over here you already learned once you didn't want it have you learned it again do you want to sit on a wild horse and just hold on for for you know to 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 try and not fall off or do you want to actually like ride the horse right for real i thought that was 
I thought it was fantastic. It was beautiful. It was powerful. And I thought it was great too that he didn't have an answer. Yeah. Do you want to live? And he went through a while. I don't know that I do. Does it even matter? Yeah. Is there, is there anybody in home world that would even care? Why? But why, Jeff? Why didn't he know? Because he had lost his purpose. He, if you have, if you have, carrying, he was carrying so much guilt. He didn't know if he want if he wanted to live. If he could not just be forgiven, but forgive himself for what he did. Much less have to go and and ask for forgiveness somewhere else, you know. Which we'll get to that in here in just a moment. But, yeah, yeah. Oh, and then and then her next step was to say that a word, a word is needed, and I was struck with that because in no surrender, no retreat. When he was talking to Jakar, he said. With a single word, I became the enemy. Yeah. And now with a single word, he can, I won't use the word, but he can change his course and no longer be the enemy. It's fine. <laughs> it's his redemption, right? But it's just, I, I love I love the idea of the power of the word. And to our earlier conversations that we've had on this show about apologies and the superpower of apologizing and the point that you've shared and how you teach your kids is to go through the steps, right? Of saying that you're sorry for specifically what happened and then explaining how or why it's not going to happen again, being sincere in your apology, doing what you can to make it right. And then this is the magic that you teach. Ask if they'll forgive you, ask for forgiveness. You actually say the words, will you forgive me? Words Londo didn't actually say, but most people don't teach people to say that. And it gets encompassed in the, I'm sorry. Like it gets wrapped up in that idea. So I, I don't want to hold it against them, but folks, I'm telling you, you take that extra step to actually say the words, will you forgive me? There is so much power. There is so much freedom. There is so much redemption that can happen with those words immediately. It's immediate. And a person, a person can only say either yes or no. And it will tell you right away what kind of person that is. And frankly, if you're a person who says no, if you're that hard, there's another conversation that needs to be had. And yeah, I, we'll let that be. Yeah. But it's just to me, I, I was struck yeah. that it's a single word, Yes. but there's so much more to it than just a single word. Sure. Well, let's get into that because there's a whole other side that he says in the next, and then in the next portion, he goes to visit a quick changing Sheridan, which I was trying to track with the clothes. So he starts in his earth force uniform and then he loses the jacket. He's just got the white shirt on. And then he's got the, uh, Alliance uniform on. Mm -hmm. And then he's got a ranger outfit on. Yeah, like a ranger Jedi outfit with the right? robes and everything. I first thought it was a Jedi outfit. It took me a moment to realize he was in, in ranger robes. And then he turned into a white light in the moost. He looked like, uh, oh my gosh, Battlestar Galactica, the original series, when they ended up like on the other side and everybody was just in pure white. There he was, and he had his, even his goatee was white. You know what, he, he looks a little bit like uh, Q in Tapestry. He really did. He really did, just with the with the goatee. Just yeah. hardened him up a little bit for Babylon 5. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Londo, I, there is something to be made of the fact that all of Londo's bottles were empty. It's a lot there. He even commented on it. Yeah. The metaphor's getting a little thick, don't you think? What was the metaphor, Jeff? Well, that he that, that he had everything that he was using to hide behind was gone. There was nowhere left to hide. The whole episode started with him arguing over his alcohol. The thing that he drowned. I mean, ever since episode one, we've seen Londo drowning his sorrows. He didn't have that as an opportunity anymore. All gone. You had you to and reality. Yeah. 
Can't put it off any longer. Um, I love the conversation between Londo and Sheridan. Londo says, it's weird knowing that we're both dying. Sheridan says, we're all dying. Oh, the time that we have left to live doesn't matter. What matters is what we do while we're waiting around, how we live out those seconds in between. Jeff, are you familiar with the dash? I'm not. How are you using your dash? When you go, the, Jeff, one of these days we're all going to die and pass away. And they're going to, they're, what's going to be left of your name, the, like the ultimate thing that's going to be left is this, this is going to be this tombstone or this plaque or whatever it is. And it's going to say, Jeff Aiken, maybe a little blurb, father, husband, podcaster extraordinaire, leadership guru. And then it's going to have a year. It's going to have a second year. And right in between is going to be a dash. Okay. That dash is your life. Here's when you were born. Here's when you died. That dash is your life. How are you using your dash? That dash is the most important part of that whole thing. That dash is, is what you did. How are you using your dash, Jeff? Wow. You know, I love that. I love that so much. I, I do an exercise myself on myself and I do it time to time. I, this isn't a one and done thing, but I also uh, take teams through it as well, but I call it attending your own funeral. Mm. So imagine that you have passed away and you're at your funeral. Who's there? What are they saying about you? What kind of conversations are people having around you know, the reception or whatever? Do you like how all that came up? Or do you not like how all that came up? Oh, this person's not there. Oh, they're not saying this. No one showed up. Well, now's your chance to change, right? Uh, I read an article a while ago about having a conversation with your 88 year old self. So have a conversation with them and ask them, Hey, knowing what you know now, what advice do you have for me? What would you stop doing? What would you start doing? How can I today, start living the life that you at 88 wish that I had lived. And they didn't say this in the article, but it struck me as I was reading, you can have that conversation with yourself when you're 87 and you can make changes to have that life. There's no like, oh, it's too late for me. I can't do it. And I think that was part of Londo's journey was when he was talking to Delenn at first, or the, the image of Delenn, there was this thing of like, yeah, I've blown it. I've gone too far. I've done too many bad things. My, my time has passed. I'm an old man. I guess it's just time for me to die. By the time he got to Sheridan, I think he started to realize that like, well, well, maybe, maybe I could make a change. Maybe I could turn and have something different. And I think for me, as we're talking about the messages in life is that it is never too late to make that change to shift and become that person that your 88 year old self wants to be, or that you want to have people talking about at your funeral. Jeff, do you know the name Colonel Sanders? I sure do. Colonel Sanders came up with Kentucky fried chicken. He didn't fry his first piece of chicken until he was 65 years old. Wow. Yeah. Actually, that's not true. He fried his first piece of chicken long before that, but he didn't start his empire until he was 65 years old. Well, Garth Brooks is another, wasn't he like in his mid thirties before he ever like strummed a chord onto a record or anything? I don't know I don't about know. that, but what I do know about Garth Brooks is he took about 18 years off of touring and recording so he could go be a dad. He chose what was most important. And you know what happened once his kids grew up and got out of the house, he went back on tour and sold out arenas sold all across out the arenas. country. And he only had to go like on four a year because he'd make enough money. <laughs> yeah. And he, and he started traveling with his wife and he like, he's living his best life. Using your dash. Well, I kept waiting for Sheridan though. And, and I don't know. I'm, I, this is a little, a little just like, Ooh, Babylon fivey thing. But everything he said was beautiful. It was amazing. But it echoed what Lorian told him 
mm-hmm. when he was dead. And I kept waiting for him to say, L- Londo, it's what happens between the tick and the talk, right? He said, it's what you do with the seconds in between, which is great. And it's a lot more, um, I think relatable for us as viewers, but it would have been a cool callback if he was just like between the tick and the talk. Yeah. Londo's response is, I haven't been very good about that part. And Sheridan in a boss way goes, no, you haven't. But there's an old saying where I'm from, Jeff, if he ain't dead, he ain't done. That's right. Sheridan gives some advice for Londo and I'm going to do my best to keep this out of the religious aspect, Jeff, because this can go down that path real quick. Yeah. Just say good luck. This does not (laughs) have to be that. Like this is just life. Like it doesn't have to, like you can attach that, but he says, here's my advice to you. Turn around, turn around. Do you know what the word is there for turn around? Do you know what Hmm. it means? What, do you know what, what Sheridan was saying in that moment, or at least what I got out of it anyway, I don't know what you got out of it. Londo has been going down this path. Londo, there's a lot of blood on your hands. There's so much blood. You can't even look back at the last few years of your life because there's, it's just covered. You haven't, you are, you are on your way to death, but you're not there yet. You haven't got there yet. You haven't done good so far, but what's left all, what did Sharon just say? He said, it doesn't, it doesn't matter when you die. It just matters what you do with the seconds in between. You're not done yet. There are still more seconds. What are you going to do with the rest of these seconds? His advice was turn around. There's a word for that. Repent. That's what repentance means. That's what repent is, is to do a 180 to you're going this direction to stop, turn around and go in the other direction. Turn around. Now we saw Jakar standing right behind him. When, if Londo were to repent, if Londo were to turn around, he would have to turn around and he would have to face this thing that is right in front of him. Not some big trial, not some big, what he would just have to face the truth in order to go forward and turn around like up to that point. Yeah. You've done really bad stuff, like really, really bad stuff. But from this moment forward, you have seconds left. You part your dash isn't done yet. You can turn around. That's all you have to do. It's, it's a lot. It's everything, it's everything that there is, but it's not a lot all at the same time. Just turn around. And Londo says he doesn't think he has any choice in the matter. You always have a choice in the matter. You can stop and turn around. You can repent. Do a 180. When he said turn around and Jakar was standing there. And I thought that was great. Just the, mm-hmm. the, the way the shot was set up. We knew like at, the, at this point, we pretty much knew what Londo had to do, but the way they visually set that up, the visual poetry of it was so gorgeous. But what it rang for me was Lady Morella, Majel Barrett, when she came in and told him like, Hey, don't mess these things up. Right. And you're going to be fine. And one of them was that he was going to have to surrender to his greatest fear. And I was like, is this that moment? His greatest fear is facing accountability and apologizing and asking for forgiveness from the person from day one he knew was going to be locked in a death throw with him. And in the moment, he couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. He couldn't do it. He found, you know, we, we'll get there. He got there, you know, to a point where he's like, well, he did even here. He got I'm to, sorry, can I, can I, can I, I'm, I'm, I hate to interrupt you. It's not that he couldn't do it. He was choosing not to do it. You know? Yeah. He Cause you can, himself, I couldn't do it. No, he could. Yeah. He chose not to do it. 
And I think to that, and it was a Londo episode. I, I'll rack my brain to, to remember which one it was, but we had that deep conversation. It might have been with Lady Morella where we talked about that, where you always have a choice. Yeah. In everything. The, the whole phrase of, well, I had no choice is a f- objective falsehood. It is not true ever. Right. It's right. always a choice. So you're right. He could, I will say, he couldn't make himself choose. Yeah. He felt he couldn't make himself choose there you go. to turn around. Mm-hmm. But then but then he did. I think that's the thing. He did too late this time. You know, he had a, he had the, the other moment he had to do with Veer before he got there and it happened. But uh oof. It was just so good. And and just showing that it's we all we all have our jakar. Mm. You know, it might not be a person, it might have been a situation. For a lot of us, it is a person. Right? But if you sit and you're honest with yourself, we all have a Jakar out there. That person that we refuse to choose to turn around. Yeah. Say the things that need to be said. Oh. Can I can I point out with Jakar as we go into this third section of the of the story? The the real life Jakar. He stood on the other side of that glass, and all Londo did was open up his eyes and say, I'm sorry, Jakar. The whole thing that happened inside of Londo's head, that was not actually Jakar. That was Londo in his own mind. What you just said a second ago, Jeff, is that we have to turn on and face our Jakar. There's a lot of people out there that are thinking like, Dude, if I in real life have to go back and talk to that person, if I in real life have to re-engage that, that's that's a deal breaker. That's not happening. That does not always has to have to happen. Sometimes that does need to happen. Sometimes it's wise for it to not happen. It's safe. It's the only safe thing for it to not happen. But it needs to happen internally. Yeah. It was the 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 guilt was represented by Jakar. That wasn't Jakar. That was Londo's own guilt. That was being that was Londo's own conscience being held up and 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 projected in the form of Jakar. And so Londo does turn around eventually. He thinks at one point, I'm sorry, he thinks at one point that it might actually be best for him to die in his guilt. Ah, maybe I should just die. What good is it going to do anyone? You know, what's good? And the truth is, it's, oh, he says, maybe it's for the best. It's not best for anyone for you to die in your guilt, for you to die in your sin, for you to die in your unforgiveness, for you to die in your unrepentance. It's not good for anyone. Londo eventually turns around. And he has this conversation. Jakar says, one word from you could have changed it all. So even, even if they didn't listen, even if nobody paid attention to you, you just could have said something. And it would have made the difference for you. But because you didn't, you're just as guilty as they are. Now, that's a whole different conversation we could have. I don't know if that's true or not. But to the point of what we're saying here, your and Londo's hands were a lot more dirty than just not saying anything. Like let's a just, lot. Let's a just lot. clear that up, okay? <laughs> um, but for him to say you didn't say anything when they wanted to go bomb my world, when they wanted to take the mass drivers out, you could have said something. You didn't. When Cartagia was torturing me, you could have said something, but you didn't. Honestly, in that moment with Cartagia, he needed to not say something, right? Because bad stuff would have happened otherwise. Like yeah. Like there, there, there are things happen. Londo turns around and he winds up metaphysically taking 39 stripes uh, in the same way that Jakar did. I, I kind of hate that that part had to happen. I really do. Um, but it got Londo to a point where he finally could get, he was broken down enough He wanted to live more than he wanted his pride. 
because he said, I I could say that's what I've never said that word to anyone before. That's Londo's pride. Mm -hmm. That's all that is, is pride. He wanted life more than he wanted pride. Folks, I'm telling you, pride is not a thing you want. It is not what it will never, ever serve you well. Ever. Ever. Never have enough too much pride to apologize for what you've done wrong. Should never have too much pride to refuse forgiveness either. That's a different story. Well, I think I think that's actually the opposite of pride. A person who is truly proud of who they are, who has true pride of purpose and personhood, when they do something wrong, they want to do better. Yeah. And so they, they admit it. They say, I was wrong. How can I do better? Help me. They give a good apology. They ask forgiveness. What we see instead is just ego. Yeah. We call it pride. You know, the, 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 the fall of pride and all those things, but it's just ego. It's all it is. Propping yourself up above all others. It's selfish. Mm -hmm. It's all of those things, but nothing good comes from that. I think it's hard because of the way language, the power of a word, right? Mm -hmm. Pride is not bad if you're truly proud in a humble way that you want to be the best that you can be. Not the best, but the best that you can be, right? Pride, e ego, would be me saying, Brent, I'm, I'm better than you. I'm better than you. Pride is me saying, I'm better than I was last time. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. And I think that Londo's ego was so out of control, his pride that he had propped up as this false person that he'd been pretending to be for his whole life mm -hmm. in a real way, finally broke down in, yeah. the, in, this, in, this, in that moment with Jakar. Yeah. I do have to say- oh, because, this, because, because sacrificing that part of your pride means admitting you were wrong. For so long, in, in Londo's case, for so long yeah. and, to, and to so much pain and death and blood yeah whereas londo could have chosen to have pride in his centauri he could have had pride in him in himself pride in the fact that he was actually a good and upstanding man that when you do something shitty sorry if you got to bleep that out but when you do something that bad that you can't live with it until you go get it right. I can't sleep until I get this fixed. I can't, I can't like, I've got it. I, this is not who I am. This is not where I want to be. This is not, this is not true to me. And I've got to get this resolved before I can go on. There's a good pride. There's a bad pride. It's yeah. unfortunate that in the English language, those are the same words for us. I wish they weren't. I wish we had different words to describe those two types of pride. And thank you for bringing that out because it's there. There are two types: mm -hmm. one good, one not good. I have to say, I love how Jakar drove it home when Londo wasn't saying that he was sorry quite yet. He was getting there, saying some of the words, and Jakar just freaked out. He's like, "You're not sorry for what you did. You're sorry that you got." caught i want to ask anybody who's ever had to stand in front of a parent a teacher a manager a judge a police officer whatever and they've been did you do this thing and you break down cry i'm so sorry oh my gosh i'm so are you are you sorry if they had never caught you and you skated away would you be upset would you be so sorry? I'm going to go out on a limb and based on my own personal experience, tell you probably not. Some things, yes. I think some things are egregious enough in our lives that we, we carry those. That's what we're dealing with here. But with Londo, I feel like Londo, we talked about it early in season three or middle of season three. He, he, he was fixing everything, right? He broke up with Morden. He told the shadows to stay away. I fi he fixed everything. So... So what's the big deal? If he was sorry, if he was really sorry, he would have gone and actually helped the Narns, not 
manipulated Cartagia and played the games that he played, he would have he would have said something. But instead he said nothing at all. And I think you had said there's a whole piece around speaking out and being as guilty as the others. And I think what where this hit me is we have a new a new word, a couple years old in our vernacular that we use, and it's anti-racism. Right? It's not enough to not be racist. You need to be an anti-racist. And at its core, that means quite a bit, but at its core, that means what we what we learned from 9-11. When you see something, say something, right? If somebody treats somebody wrong, you call it out. You say a thing. This is the responsibility of every single citizen in the world. Sheridan gave us this in Intersections in Real Time when he said that I will say, no, I won't one more time than you can say, yes, you will. All of us have to stand up. We have to say no sometimes. Sometimes we have to stand up and say, what you just did, what you just said, not okay. And I'm not going to put up with it because if one person does that, another person will, and eventually others will also. That's how change happens. This is a powerful statement and has become more powerful for us in, in, in modern times where we can't just quietly watch and see things happen. When you were talking earlier, you know, about, well, you know, they... You know, they, they came for the Narns and then they came for this and then they came for, for Londo. And well, first they came for the Jews and then they came for the invalid. How many times in our history have we seen this? You know, I came and I said nothing and then they came for me mm-hmm. and there was no one left to say anything. When you see something that's wrong, you have to speak out and say something. But to your point, if that wildly insane, crazy murderhead person is sitting there and is ready to kill you in a second, maybe in your enclosed doors and no one knows what's going to happen, maybe you don't say something right then. Maybe you wait and then you go to HR afterwards or whatever. <laughs> Jeff, if I could add on to what you're saying, mm-hmm. this, is, this is a Brentism. This is not anything the show was trying to tell us. This is, this is just Brent's own observation and, and, I happen to have a microphone and a platform with which to to say this. You know, one of the most obnoxious phrases that anyone can say whenever something bad happens. Ah, thoughts and prayers oh. go out to you. Why is that obnoxious? Because they don't do anything. It's ineffective. Like that. That's what makes it obnoxious. Because first of all, you know, the person who said thoughts and prayers really isn't thinking about you beyond the saying of that phrase. And they're really not praying for you. And even if they were, you don't really think that that's doing any good for you. To to reiterate what you just said, Jeff, you got to call it out. I would add to that. To simply call it out on social media is not enough. You have to call it out in real life. In fact, You could never say anything on social media, but if you call it out in real life, you're doing your job because social media is the ether. Mm -hmm. It's not call, put it out there. It's not bad to do that. But if you're satisfied with just saying it on Facebook or Twitter or Mastodon or truth or whatever you're on, but you're not going to say it to the person standing across, aside to the person who's sitting across the Thanksgiving dinner table from you to call it out. Then you're not doing, you're, you're not, you're not in that spot. But as Jeff said, if you're in a closed room, use some relational intelligence there as well. Just a it's, little bit. It, you, it's a line to walk for sure. It is, but I think it's important to, to still say, it. you know, yeah. uh, quite some time ago, maybe about a year ago or so, um, you specifically, but, but, but I was very happy to be a part of the message, but we, we, you openly called out how we support the, the members of our community that are trans. Mm-hmm. We have a, we have a, a lot of incredible members of our community that, that are all of the genders, right? But we specifically, because there are, there's, well, there still is awful things happening to people that are trans. Mm-hmm. It's, it's unconscionable, um, the, the world that many of you are having to live in right now, mm-hmm. but I called it out 
and said it and you put it out there. We did it in the moment and we did it with a level of risk. What we know is we lost patrons. We lost listeners and we lost viewers for doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Not only is that okay, that's fine. I mean, it's, it's we regret good. Out of it. Yeah. 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 But my point is speaking for you and, 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 and tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think I am, but we consider ourselves to be allies of people that are unrepresented, underrepresented out in the world or unrepresented entirely. Mm -hmm. I like to go a step further even and say that like, I like to think of myself as an accomplice. Like I'm not just going to be an ally, but I'm going to go and actively mess some stuff up for you. Like, let's do this. Real allyship though means, it, it means that there's risk involved. I don't get to sit with my phone on Twitter or whatever, and oh, I think this thing was bad, or but I don't get to do that. That's all show. I have to put myself out there where there's risk. Now, not the level of risk where Cartagia will murder me horrifically for for no purpose. But what I think about is uh, an example I have where I had a early episode of the Starfleet Leadership Academy where I talked about women in IT and how they're not given a fair opportunity and some real objective cases. Of, of discrimination and hiring practices. And I had a person reach out to me through email and I made a mistake of feeding the troll, Brent. I fed, I fed the troll. Never feed the trolls, Jeff. <laughs> this guy lit into me about how, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a couple some women, some women have had a, a tough time, but I mean, the pendulum swung so far now, white straight men can't even get a job. Any really, <laughs> I mean, why don't you, why don't you turn around? bro. And just like, white dudes can't get job. We're doing just fine. A buddy of mine a while ago, buddy, I use that term loosely and a, a person I know was joking, but I, I he says, uh, right now in the history of all time is the worst time to be a, a straight hetero cis white man. And frankly, it's still pretty dang good. And I'm like, yeah, because we are not moving the needle fast enough to bring everybody on board into real parity and equity. We're not doing it fast enough. We're working hard, but not hard enough. To work hard enough, we, those of us with privilege, need to use that privilege, put ourselves in areas of risk and danger where we can lose our jobs, where we can be called out on social, we can be canceled. Well, I don't know if people cancel each other anymore. I'm an old person, so I say things like that, but... We have to put ourselves on the line. Otherwise, it's just performative. It's just having a black picture, black square for your profile picture. Ooh, that moved the dial. Thoughts and prayers. Hey, thoughts and prayers are great. Thank you for them. Don't tell me. Don't waste your breath or your keystrokes telling me that you're giving me your thoughts and prayers because you know what? You should be anyway. We are... We are the brotherhood of humanity, the sisterhood of hum whatever. We're the family of humanity. We should be thinking and praying, if that's what you do, sending good vibes, whatever. We should be doing that no matter what. You don't wait for the tragedy. Sorry. <laughs> well said. Well said, my friend. Um That was a lot of words. Yes. Londo needed one word. One. One word. And he got there. He eventually got there. Jeff, if you're okay with it, I'd like to bring this one home. You may. I just want to for the sake of doing it because this was so powerful to me. And if I'm stealing this from you, I'll cut it out. <laughs> But when he woke up and he looked at Jakar, I just want to say what he said because I thought it was beautiful. He wakes up, he opens his eyes and he looks and he sees Jakar and he just says, Jakar, I'm sorry, Jakar. And then Jakar broke. Yeah. Like he broke. Yeah. Because he said, sorry. Yeah. Oh, bring it home, Brent. Bring it home. Here's the question, Jeff. This is the million dollar question. Can the irredeemable be redeemed? I am here to unequivocally say 
Yes. The irredeemable can be redeemed. Two and a half seasons ago, when I first said that there was no redemption for Londo Malari, that he was irredeemable, I knew then the redemption for Londo Malari was still on the table. Because... As this episode pointed out, let's talk about the the messages that Babylon 5 gave us in this episode. If you ain't dead, you ain't done. All you have to do is turn around. Do you want to live or do you want to die? Real life. Do you want to have real life? Well, if you're not dead yet, you've got life left. Turn around repent it's that simple and then there's a word i'm sorry londo's redemption hinged in no way shape or form on jakar's response jakar could have had the worst response in the world jakar could have said no I don't forgive you. Apology not accepted. That would have been on Jakar, and Jakar has got to deal with that. But for Londo, that is entirely him. And he needed to come to a, a point of real contriteness, real brokenness over his own, uh, for lack of a better word, sin. Right? He needed to repent. And, and it is that easy. The irredeemable can be redeemed. Now, you may still have consequences. A guy sitting in jail does not suddenly get out of jail because they have a change of heart and they say that they're sorry. A guy sitting in jail can still be redeemed. Yes. Redemption is there that's what this episode is saying that's what babylon 5 is saying and they took an entire episode broke it down into three parts this is what charles dickens was saying back in a christmas carol this really is a christmas carol that's really what this was in so many ways can an irredeemable person be redeemed yes you can because you're not done folks if you ain't dead you ain't done your dash isn't done Use it well, and if you've you've been going down one path and that path is leading to death, that path has so much destruction, the redemption happens when you stop, you turn 180 degrees around, say your word, and go forward from there. You can't just stay. You, you got to go forward. You, you can't live here. You can't stay here. That's a buzzer, Jeff. Uh you gotta, you gotta. Just waiting for you to stop. <laughs> Jeff, this is a five white fury. Or white fury. <laughs> this is a five white star episode through and through. This is this is a phenomenal message. This is a message that has been four seasons and two episodes in the making to get us to this spot right here. And the message isn't done yet because now we got to see what Londo's going to do with it next week and the week after and the week after that. You see where he's going. But the redemption, it guys, it, like it's that easy. It's just that easy. Like it's hard. But did, and that's the thing. Do you see how hard it was for Londo to get there to that spot? But what, what, what was hard about it, Jeff? It was all internal. It was all internal. It's your own self. You got to fight on that. Not, not the Jakar in real life that was standing on the other side of glass. It was the Jakar in his mind. It was his own. I've never said this word. It was his own pride. Redemption is possible. Five white stars through and through Jeff. We've said it on a handful of episodes, but this is one that it rings truer than any other one that if we could do more than five, this is, this is, this is all of the white stars. Every single one. Every all of them. Yes. There's 110 episodes. That's 550 potential white stars. They all are in this one. Yes. Yeah. Well, Jeff, uh, 
I had white stars. If I kept white stars, I guess you get to kind of keep your thing. And your thing is you get to rank this episode in our absolute 100% completely accurate definitive ranking of season five of Babylon 5. Now, our current ranking it currently has no compromises in the top spot. And then you get to pick, Jeff. Where does this episode go? <laughs> Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a thing that we said right around episode six of the fourth season, which was this is the number one uh, episode of this season and possibly the number one episode of this entire series. I'm gonna just going to repeat that statement right here that the very long night of Londo Malari is the number one episode of this season so far and possibly the number one or maybe top two, three to five, whatever, of the entire series of Babylon 5. This I, is incredible. I would agree. This potentially could be a top three episode of um of the series if 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 what i have heard is correct the series finale is phenomenal yeah into the fire phenomenal episode one of the most beautiful hours of television i've ever seen in my life this one is right there is this above or below into the fire well we'll debate that much later on yeah. Is it above or below whatever that finale episode is? I don't know. We haven't seen it yet. We'll figure that out when we get there. It wouldn't surprise me if we went back and we ranked all the episodes. Those were the top three. And I don't know what's left. in. I, there's 20 more episodes of season five to go. I don't know what's left. <laughs> well, let's get to the next one, right? Because that's it for the very long night of Londo Malari. Next week, we're watching The Paragon of Animals for the first time. We've never seen these episodes before. We haven't read any descriptions, synopses, seen any thumbnails or anything. We like to play a game where we guess and predict what the next episode is going to be about. So Brent, based on the title alone, what do you think The Paragon of Animals is going to be about? You know, Jeff, every once in a while we get an episode like this. Parliament of Dreams immediately comes to mind. <laughs> Where the episode was not about a parliament or about dreams. I don't think this episode is about paragons or animals. So the name is going to be absolutely no help. So I'm going to go out on a limb. You know what it's time for, Jeff? It's time for a cabinet meeting. Okay. It's time for a cabinet. Yes, my Hamilton fans out there. I'm going to stop right there and not try to wrap anything. President Sheridan is calling together the alliance worlds to choose a cabinet and various members of these alliance worlds are vying for prime spots within the cabinet purple and green drazi come back the great egg people come back ultimately this is a political episode about the early days of the alliance and them getting them stuff together i cannot imagine that next week goes anywhere near as deep as what this one did Next week almost needs to be a palate cleanser type of an episode after this one because this was such, I mean, great episode. Great, great. Can you imagine if this episode was in season four? Yeah. Oh. I mean, my gosh. Oh. I, I, Jeff, I, I've, I, think, I think season four is better than season three. I yeah. really, I re, even, even with those middle set of episodes, season four just had so much. And season three was phenomenal. Season three is phenomenal. And you know what? Season five so far, it's off to a pretty dang good start, man. Yeah, really is. What do you think? Well, I don't see him bringing in a zoo or like an alien animal. Kind of like, oh, we're going to ride these alien animals to I fight. I really wanted you to say alien ant farm, but go ahead. I'm not that smooth of a criminal. <laughs> now, what I, what I think of when I think of Paragon of animals, animals, right? is Psychor's view of normals. Oh. As far as Psychor is concerned, normals are basically animals. So I think this is going to be a Bester episode. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be Bester um, putting his pieces in place to make his move on the government. It's going to lead to the, the telepath war. And he needs, like, I don't know, maybe he's going to make a move for like office of the president or something like that. But either way, he's going to have to ally himself with a normal. And so he's going to be looking for the best of the normals, the paragon 
of the animals and try and form some sort of an alliance within EarthGov um, so that he can have, he can basically have that puppet politician in place that uh, he can, he can help get, get elected and then have the telepaths rule the earth. And I guess we'll find out here next week. Thank you all so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or wherever you watch us. Leave us a rating and a review. And please share this podcast with someone that loves Babylon 5 or is about to fall in love with this incredible series. Until next time. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, man. What's up? So, Bravari, mm -hmm. what do you think it tastes like? Have you ever tasted something so fragile, so delicate that it just feels like a soft velvety blanket enveloping your tongue? Yeah, it's called Pepto-Bismol. Oh, dude, that's gross. I, I say we just get the hell out of here. Initiating getting the hell out of here maneuver. We're not some, some deep space franchise. This station is about something. I like I gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. I like it. I like it. That's that that ring that that made sense. I liked it. I liked it. We got it. You got to even out Ivanova in the music a little bit, though. Yeah. See, see her just a smidge in the music. Dude, dude almost nailed it. 100%. Well, thanks. Yeah. What an episode, man. Good Lord, this episode. Uh, Club 65. Jeff, let me, okay, so Club 65, the, the, the cool thing about Club 65, this is where I think the, my favorite thing that we get to do here is uh, basically the notes that you didn't mention in the recording of the episode. This is where you kind of get to run through those. Yeah. Do you have any that you didn't mention and bring up? I loved how much fun Zach was having holding that Brafari back. Dude, <laughs> dude, no, no, hold on, hold on. I had a note about him. Zach is looking good, man. He is. He he got promoted, and it's like he went to like the main cast member's hair and makeup trailer now. Like he's he's not in the secondary characters' makeup and hair trailer now. He's he's in the main characters now. It, it, it honestly, like there was a scene with him last week. I think you talked about it where he had the earpiece in. Yeah. And then this whole thing where like it it broke my heart for Jeff Conaway because I don't know if you've seen like he was in. Um, Oh my gosh, I did some of those like uh, addiction recovery reality shows in the early 2000s and stuff he was on and he he could barely talk. Um he 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 fell, he fell really hard. Yeah. And uh seeing him like this where he looked healthy, he looked happy, he looked damn good. Yeah. Like it it broke my heart for him. I thought it was funny with Lanier how he's doing his job. Like he's sitting there with the Len. He's like, oh, you got a three o'clock with so-and-so and and a four mm -hmm. o'clock with this. And then she's like, I know you're leaving. And he's like, well, you don't, you don't need me anymore. But dude, you're literally doing the thing she needs you for. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And he, you know, the thing is, is Lanier, Lanier missed that, the value he brought to Delenn, and, th and this is the thing he really missed, the value he brought to Delenn was not in what he could do, but was in who he was. Yeah. Jeff, you and I have had this conversation so many times on this show before. It's not in what you do. It's in you. It's in your presence. That's what Delenn valued. And, I mean, for... <laughs> Yeah, the 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 linear stuff. Like, I get it. He has every right to be there. It upsets me because it's so dumb mm -hmm. and it's so immature. Because you couldn't have her in this one way, you just said you couldn't have her because you couldn't handle it, dude. Put okay. Look, if 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 we were bros with me and Lanier, you know what I'm doing? I'm putting my hand on his shoulder and I'm saying, dude, man up. Yeah. Put your big boy pants on. It'll be okay. Hey, there's a cute one over there. Why don't you go talk to her? You have a good, solid relationship here with her right now. Don't screw this up. Right? Be an adult. That's what I would say. He can take it or leave it. Do whatever he wants with it. But, uh, 
yeah that was that he just he missed he missed that idea i think in some way uh and it became honestly became more about him than it did about them yep you know um yeah so i will say this though uh the the we didn't talk about this at all the veer and lanier scene yeah in this episode first of all i realize now we did not get nearly enough of those scenes throughout the run of the show agreed we got enough that when we saw this scene we were like oh it's they're doing one of these things but they probably only done like three of these yeah. we needed more of those those should have been like a like a staple like mm -hmm. put it in every episode like just here's this one this one scene between the two of them saying something and it's and it's fun and they clink glasses and each go their separate yeah um when they said their goodbyes though veer used the mimbari symbol like he mm -hmm. together and did the did the that thing and then he lost it and hugged him anyway and lanier was like okay cool whatever uh but i i love that i loved that lanier kind of did the or that veer did the the respectful mimbari thing yeah you know um but i i love that they said goodbye Stephen first by the way talk about looking good he's looking seriously good. Yeah, he went from looking unhealthy, thin, to just like dudes in his element. Yeah, like he's, he looks good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks straight up good. I like the joke too of just like I've studied humans and their fates. I don't know of a Shirley Temple, <laughs> you know, or a temple named Shirley. That was, right. Does I, I liked that? But on Veer though, Veer and Londo mm -hmm. in there. That oh my god, that incredible line from Veer prophecy is a guess that comes true yeah when it doesn't it's a metaphor oh that's so good yeah and speaking of veer and lanier mm -hmm. veer has a similar kind of weird thing like that with londo except londo's a lot more um aggressive and almost borderline abusive with veer mm -hmm. but we've talked before about the love that they have for each other and veer just rolls with it gets what he can and builds on what he's able to build on yeah. and the only time he packed up and ran away was when londo told him to yeah. made him you know why londo was always redeemable because veer never gave up on him yeah yeah you know what i mean and and i don't mean that because of veer but because of Veer, that all there was always something good left in him. I, I mean, if Darth Vader can be redeemed, yeah, you know, Luke Skywalker sitting there, like there's something good in you still. I can feel it. I know it's there. That's what I got to tap into. That's but I think Londo, I think Londo knew it too. It's why he kept Veer around. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Tried to get rid of him, sent him off, and then things got worse, and he brought him but, back. But why did he send him off though? Well, he says, and I, and I and I agree with it to a point to protect him. Yeah. Like, there's some not good there, stuff coming. There's some not good stuff coming. I want to protect you. There's also the I need you not around so that I can do that. Yeah, I have to go make these decisions. I have to yeah. have these conversations. But I also need to kind of protect you from that. Not just get yeah. you out of here, but I need to protect you from that. And he said that at some point. He's like, mm -hmm. you know, I've I've grown attached to Veer. I like him, and I don't. He doesn't deserve this. Like, you know yeah you know phenomenal episode uh club 65 you guys are awesome make sure you get your gear dude i i get love ly slash b5 yeah, club 65. It's, it's down the thing I, I love seeing seeing the things my favorite thing and these are your we give you these instructions often but they, they bear repeating especially if you're new to club 65 if you are welcome this is the this is the thing club 65 is the babylon 5 for the first time after show exactly that we don't talk about we that's the thing if you know you know and if you don't know you don't and you don't talk about it you don't tell them show us your shirts put them out put them on the, the social media on the stuff we dude it makes me so happy to see this stuff it's awesome yeah. but my favorite thing is when somebody's like what's that and you either don't answer or you respond back and just say these are the words if you know you know if you know you don't know. give it don't give it away this is a special place this is your special place mm -hmm. don't give it away Mm -hmm. And you know what the people here at Club 65, most of them don't realize? There's a Club 65 squared. There is. Yeah. And that's, that's, buddy, that's, uh, that's deep cut yeah. stuff. And right you know there. what? If you know it, then you know it. <laughs> and we know that some of Club 65 squared are here right now. So 
there's a, that is a small club. There's an exclusivity there. And uh, if you happen to find your way to it, congratulations. Uh, that's, that's the coolest thing about club 65 is <laughs> all you got to do is find your way there and you're in like there, is you're no, in. there's nothing to, there's no gatekeeping to it outside of if you're smart enough to find it, then here you go. So it's got to find it. That's all there is to it. We don't hide it. It's not hidden nope. at all. No, nope. we're always there. Yeah. We've always been there. Right. I said, I think I, there was something I said a while ago. I was like, we don't talk about it. And people are like, why? I was like, I don't know. I don't make the rules. And I was like, oh, wait, actually, <laughs> like, shoot, I did make the rules. I kind of, I guess that is on me. Uh, <laughs> all right, Jeff, we're going to get out of here for tonight. Club C5, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you guys later this week for Brent Watches. Jeff's going to be over on his reaction on Patreon. And, uh, and we'll be right back here next Monday. Doing it again. It was all over again. Bye, guys. See you.